Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Software Carpentry. Our goal in the next couple of days is to teach you a few basic computing skills that will make you a more effective researcher. Our goal is not to turn you into a professional programmer. It, instead, it's to show you just a handful of things that will allow you to get more done in less time with less pain. And if you want an analogy, we think that every scientist should know as much about computing as they know about statistics. Most of you aren't statisticians, but at some point you've learned what correlation means, what statistical significance is, how to calculate a p-value. We think you should have the equivalent computing skills and should know enough to be able to tell when you're out of your depth and when you need to go and find a professional to help you with the really hard stuff. Now, I have to start by saying that recorded video, like this, is not a particularly effective instructional medium for novices. And here's why. When you come to the table to learn something for the first time, you're bringing with you everything you've learned before. Not just the facts, but also the mental categories, the, the conceptual buckets that that knowledge has been put into. As we teach you new material, Initially, you're going to be trying to fit that into those existing buckets. You can't help but do this. The problem is, they're not the right buckets. And to paraphrase Tolstoy, everybody who understands something correctly understands it more or less the same way. But everybody who understands something incorrectly under misunderstands it differently. If you've ever TA'd a course, you've seen this. Students will come in and ask questions about assignments that simply make no sense. It's not that they're stupid, it's not that they didn't read it, it's that they're trying to take what they've read and put it into the wrong buckets. And if you're a novice programmer, you will do the same thing with a lot of what we try to teach you. The reason video isn't an effective instructional medium for novices is that it can't correct the thousand and one misconceptions that people have. This video can't stop ask you a question, figure out what it is that you've misunderstood and how you've misunderstood it, and then correct that misconception. We can try to correct a few common ones, but there's a very long tail distribution. There's only a handful of things that most people get wrong. Everything else is unique to the individual. What we would like you to do is use this as a starting point and then pester us with questions. Info at softwarecarpentry.org is a very useful email address. We will answer as responsively as we can. If there's something you don't get, please ask us. Please also use these videos to help learn how to teach this material yourself. If you've already mastered some of these skills, then the next step is to go and pass them on to your lab mates, to the people whose papers you're reviewing, to the people who are going to review your papers, and eventually to your own students, so that everybody's life gets better. Being an expert in something does not make you an expert teacher of that thing. You can be very, very good at some task or at some skill and not be able to transfer that knowledge. And you've all been in classrooms where the instructor may have been a Nobel Prize winner in the subject, but couldn't actually explain it to a novice. Part of what we're doing with these recorded videos is trying to show you how we teach this material. So, with that out of the way, I have to spend a couple of minutes talking about psychology before I can start talking about programming. Because computers and software might be mathematical entities, but the act of programming is a human activity, and the only way to understand what works and what doesn't is to understand a little bit about psychology. The very first thing you need to understand is the magic number 7 plus or minus 2. For years, we have known that human memory, to rough first approximation, can be divided into two layers. At the bottom layer is long-term memory. As far as we know, its capacity is unbounded. You will die before it fills up. It's associative. You don't recall things by location or by index. You recall them by pattern matching. A face reminds you of another face. A smell reminds you of a high school gym. Uh, a certain song reminds you of you know, first year at university. The problem with long-term memory is that it's fairly slow. It can take hundreds of milliseconds to pull something out. So sitting on top of that is another layer called short-term memory or working memory. It's also associative. It works by pattern matching. It's very fast on the order of milliseconds or less, but it's also very small. The average human being's short-term memory can hold about seven unrelated facts reliably for a few seconds. That's it. That's your working set. That's where the 7 plus or minus 2 comes from. If you need to remember more unrelated or arbitrary facts than about this many, 
error rates start to climb. And even if you're only remembering this many, if they're not continually refreshed, they start to drop out of short-term memory, and again, error rates start to climb. And one piece of evidence for this is actually phone numbers. Independently all over the world in the 1920s, companies settled on phone numbers that were six, seven, eight digits long. Why? Because if you have an old rotary phone that you have to dial, you need to read the number out of the phone book and remember that arbitrary string of digits long enough to dial it into a phone, which takes several seconds. If you've got a long phone number, you won't be able to remember the last few digits accurately enough. You'll have to look back at the book and again, error rates will go up, failure rates will go up. Now, at this point you're saying, but wait a second, modern phone numbers aren't seven digits long. Here in Toronto, we now have to dial an area code plus seven digits. That's ten in total. That works because you don't remember an area code as three digits. You remember it as one fact. This is called chunking, and it's another very important thing about human mental performance that you need to understand in order to understand programming. When you think about the spots on a dice, you don't count the five spots. You see the X pattern, and your brain says that's one fact. That cross pattern means five. So you've taken five dots and compressed them into one. You'll see this over and over again in many, many other mental activities. We take a bunch of things that co-occur frequently, group them together, and remember them as one fact. This allows chess masters to remember tens of thousands of positions. They're not actually remembering the locations of the pieces. They're remembering patterns like I castled kingside, which allows you to take three pawns, a rook, and a king, that's five pieces, and compress it down to one fact. The problem with chunking is what happens when the chunks are incorrect. Here's another fact about chess masters. Suppose I take a chess position, set it up, cover it with a cloth, and bring two people in. One of them is a novice chess player and one of them is an expert. Take back the cloth, give them a couple of seconds to look at the position and cover it up again. Now they have to go and reconstruct the position on another board from memory. Pretty clearly, the expert does better than the novice, right? Not necessarily. If it's a real chess position from a real game, absolutely, the expert outperforms the novice. But if we set the pieces up at random, in locations that can't possibly legally occur in a game, the expert's performance is actually worse than that of the novice. Because the expert's brain is misremembering things because they're matching against patterns that aren't actually present in the pieces. And you've seen this in other phenomena. If you're looking at typing mistakes in words, typing mistakes are more likely to occur, spelling mistakes are more likely to occur at the ends of words than at the beginnings. Because what your eye does is read the first few letters, figure out from context what the word is, and skip on to the next word. And if you do eye tracking studies, you can see the eye do that as it's skipping through the words. Your brain is filling in the gaps to make you think that you read all of the letters. But in fact, you didn't. Why does this apply to programming? Well, number one, if at any point in a program your brain has to have in working memory more than about this number of unrelated facts, then you won't be able to write or understand the next line of code very well. If, for example, you're in the middle of a function or a program and there's 30 variables flying around and you have to keep track of all 30 of them in order to write the next expression, your error rates are going to skyrocket. What we have to do when we're building software is cut things down, squeeze them down to create chunks that will fit into working memory. And this is the key to building larger programs that actually work without superhuman effort. What we do, instead of writing a program, is build a bunch of pieces that we assemble into larger pieces that we then assemble into our program. Flipping it over, if we have a large problem, the key to programming is breaking it into chunks that can then be broken into chunks which can be broken into chunks so that it will fit into memory. Now, if we do this well, those chunks can be reused. If, for example, you've written a function that will read data from a file, then you can reuse that in the next script you write to analyze the next set of data because it's the same format of file. And that's great. That saves you time because you're reusing code. But code reuse is only part of why we break programs up, only part of why we try to create components for software. The real reason is we have to fit things into this hardware, and this hardware is not getting faster or larger at all, except on a scale of tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Okay? The second thing 
the second way this relates, is that we have to make sure you've got the right set of chunks, the right set of patterns in your head, so that when you read code, you will pattern match correctly and say, these five lines mean this one thing. Or, I want to do this one thing, that means I should create these five lines. We have to give you a vocabulary. That only comes with practice. You have to write and read lots of code over and over again, just as you have to play lots of scales, just as you have to practice a foreign language or do lots of mathematical proofs. We're going to get you started on that path. We hope we'll be pointing you in the right direction. So, with all of this said, it's time to go back to your computers, open up a shell, and we're going to start doing some programming. At this point, whoever is teaching you, if you're in a live workshop, should have checked that you've got the software installed and should have given you a worksheet with a list of all of the Unix commands that we're going to go through this morning. What we'd like you to do as we go through the lesson is write your own definitions of those commands, your own explanations to yourselves of what those various commands mean. By the end of the lesson, you should have seen all of them. And we'll be asking you periodically, or rather your instructor will be asking, since this is just a recorded video, but your instructor will be asking you periodically, what is your definition of this command or that command, so that we can get some insight into what you actually took away from what we said. That will allow us to correct your misconceptions. One last thing before we start. The most effective large-scale teaching technique we know of is called peer instruction. And it's often associated with the name of Professor Eric Mazur at Harvard, but it's been widely used in a lot of other contexts. Here's the basic idea. Your instructor should have put you in a group of three or four people, sitting at the same table, sitting side by side. Maybe because of the seating arrangement, you're just paired up. But it's really important that you're not flying solo through these lessons. What we're going to do periodically is ask you a question or give you a little exercise. When you're working through it, work through it with your partner or your partners. Talk to them. Discuss it amongst yourselves. Come up with some sort of a consensus answer. Then we'll show you our solution and ask, answer any questions you have. And then we'll give you a minute or two to talk amongst yourselves again. Because if you got the wrong answer, the odds are very good that somebody in your group, your partner or somebody in your group, will understand what your misconception was. In a room of 40 or 400 people, it's impossible for the instructor to get insight into everybody's mind and clear up everybody's misconceptions. If we want to scale, what we have to do is get you to do that for each other. So, when you do the exercises, Please ignore everything that grade school and undergraduate taught you about the evils of sharing work and the evils of communicating with people. I think one of the great failings of today's educational system is that we tell you for 13 or 15 years that working with other people is plagiarism, that it's cheating, and we punish you for it, and then we wonder why you don't know how to cooperate with each other when you need to. Well, we're going to try to break that pattern here. Work with your partner. Talk it through with them. Close one of the laptops and have two people working on one laptop. That's very effective. Once you see the answer, take a minute or two to talk it through again to make sure that everybody understands it and that everybody's particular misconceptions have been cleared up. This will help you learn more, more accurately, faster, and it'll be more fun. So, you should have a computer. It should have a Unix shell installed on it. If you're using Linux or Mac, you've already got one. If you're using Windows, your instructor will have told you what to download and how to install it. Somebody should have checked that you've got the software working. And you should have a worksheet ready to go. Okay? Let's all go and start typing.